All right, um, my name's Rogan Dawes. Um, I'm here representing the Open Web Application Security Project. Have any of you ever heard of it? OWASP? A few people? Great, wonderful. Um, I'm a application security engineer for a company called Aspect Security. Um, Aspect Security is heavily involved in OWASP and they support my work on um, Web Scarab as well. So I'd give a bit of a quick plug here. All right, so OWASP, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's short for the Open Web Application Security Project. It was founded around 2000 by a group of people that have been chatting on a mailing list, discussing various um, web application security issues, um, starting from the early SQL injection things that people like Rainforest Puppy came up with. Um, and they realized that something really needed to be done in order to address these continuing security problems. So it's made up of a, a group of um, security experts from around the world and just you know, interested individuals, and they're contributing their time because they believe that this is a, a big problem and something needs to be done. Um, we produce commercial quality tools as well as some very good documentation. Um, the, one of the, uh, the big products of the uh, OWASP project is the top 10 most critical web application security vulnerabilities. This list has been adopted by the FTC, uh, American uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, and the payment card industry, which is a consortium of Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Diners, etc., as the standard for application security. Um, you can read the uh, 10 most wanting list. Basically, it's a... Um, and it's really intended as an awareness document to highlight for managers and project managers and that sort of thing um, just what, you know, how big the problem is and to make people ask the question, do I have these kinds of problems in my applications? Okay, so, oh, you know, sorry, excuse me, let me just fix this screen. Tried to, tried to get too clever with the resolution. Okay, so that's a bit better. All right, so those are the, um, the areas of the, of the top 10. Um, Garrett was talking about validation in Cake PHP being such an important thing. Failing to validate your input parameters that you then process in your application is one of the core problems uh, that lead to security vulnerabilities. Um, broken access control, not checking whether somebody is allowed to perform an action correctly. Um, Broken account and session management, allowing people to brute force usernames and passwords, allowing people to access um, functions without checking their passwords correctly, uh, cross-site scripting, uh, buffer overflows, command injection, um, failing to handle error conditions correctly. Um, these have all led to pretty serious uh, vulnerabilities. And so this was just really um, an awareness uh, just to, to make the the um, application owners or project managers ask the questions of their development teams. Another very good documentation resource is the OWASP guide, um, the guide for, guide for building secure web applications and web services. One of the big problems that we see is that there is a lot of information about how to do things, but there's not a whole lot of information about how to do them securely. Um, and so the guide is intended to be that document that gives you the information about how to build, how to, what sort of requirements you should have in your applications from a security perspective. Um, it has code samples in various languages, so it's a very, very good resource on how to actually um, uh, include security in your applications. Another tool from uh, OWASP is WebGoat. It's a deliberately vulnerable Java web application 
uh, and the idea is that it provides a safe environment for learning about security vulnerabilities. The obvious thing here is that you can't just go out and test if, there, if uh, an arbitrary site on the internet has got security vulnerabilities in it because you are likely to get yourself into all kinds of trouble. Um, so don't try any of the things that I'm going to show you today uh, on sites that you do not have permission to test. Um, some of you may have heard the story about the tsunami hacker, a guy named uh, Daniel Cuthbert living in the UK. Uh, when the tsunami hit in the, uh, in the Far East on uh, Boxing Day 2006, he decided that he was going to donate some money to a site that was uh, soliciting donations. Being a security consultant, he thought, well, you know, I should really check to make sure that the site is secure before I hand over my credit card details. So he tried a couple of things. You know, they were unsuccessful. And so he went ahead, entered his credit card numbers, and made a donation. Those couple of tests that he had tried triggered off an intrusion detection system. They tracked him down because he gave them his credit card number, and he was convicted. So don't try this um, uh, without proper authorization. Another of the um, important OWASP uh, resources is the local chapters. Um, the local chapters basically provide a forum for people who are interested in application security to get together and discuss what they're doing, how to do various things um, in the application security field. Um, free and open to anybody to participate. Go to the OWASP site and see if there is a local chapter in your area. Uh, if there isn't, maybe you'd like to start one. Um, typically, they meet on a monthly or quarterly basis, just depending on the amount of interest. And there'll be presentations and discussions of um, the key application security topics. Basically, whatever um, people are interested in, they'll generally find somebody to talk about it. Another um, thing that the OWASP project does is they host um, conferences on a, uh, periodically. Uh, in the past, we've had two annually. Well, the first one in New York was just the, the first one for that year. And then we've had one in Europe and one in America uh, each year since. This year, they're going to be three. Um, one in Australia, which is a new thing for us. Um, that's actually next week. And then one here in Brussels for the second time, coming up in May, and then New York in October. Um, some of you may have participated in the Google uh, Summer of Code. OWASP has its own season of code, uh, autumn and spring of code so far. And basically, just like the, um, the Google Summer of Code, the intention is to encourage people, participants, um, existing or new participants, to work on uh, OWASP project. Uh, one of the things I haven't mentioned is that uh, OWASP is very uh, focused on making sure that the resources that they provide remain freely available. There's no uh, subscription this, or if you pay extra, you get access to something else. Everything that OWASP does is freely available. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to sign up and pay, pay over uh, large amounts of money to get access to anything uh, special. Everything that is there is readily available. And as I mentioned, it's done by volunteers, so you don't always get the kind of progress that you'd like to see. So uh, we encourage people by sponsoring them in these uh, season of code projects. So some examples of the output from this, uh, these uh, sponsorships. The testing guide is a good document that explains how to actually test for various vulnerabilities. Um, the anti-SAMI project. How many of you, did any of you hear about the uh, MySpace worm? Sammy is my hero. Yes, Sammy is my hero. <laughs> Sammy is a guy who wrote a worm that took over MySpace. Well, basically, it brought MySpace down in the period of around, I think, 18 hours. Uh, basically, what he did was he found a uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. Somebody visited his profile. It added Sammy to his profile as a, as a friend and added the text, you know, Sammy is my hero. Um, and then when somebody else viewed that person's profile, it, you know, it just expanded exponentially from there. And he ended up with something like a million friends or something on Facebook. <laughs> and the site just shut down. It just couldn't conceive of somebody who was so popular. Um, <laughs> so 
one of the, actually one of the Aspects employees created the anti-SAMI project, which is a, a mechanism for sanitizing arbitrary, XM, uh, arbitrary HTML uh, content. So it translates it into XML, uh, parses out anything that is not a recognized uh, safe piece of HTML or safe attribute of a, uh, a HTML tag, and there are various different profiles depending on what you want to allow and what you don't. Um, so that's actually a pretty neat project. And then another example, the WebGoat Solutions Guide. I'm going to be showing you guys WebGoat shortly so you can see what that's about. Uh, the Solutions Guide obviously helps you to uh, complete the various lessons. And we, and so we've paid out more than $100,000 in sponsorships over, the l over those two uh, projects. So if you are interested in application security, maybe um, take a look, see if anything interests you uh, when the next one comes up. Okay, so what's the problem again? Uh, you know, application security, in many cases, an organization doesn't even think about it. They simply trust that their developers know that they have to produce secure code, and they know how to do that. Um, and that's even if they've ever thought about it. It's like security? Yeah, yeah, no, it's being taken care of. Our developers know what to do. And in many cases, that trust is misplaced. Developers don't know that security is their responsibility. If you're working in an organization, many times you ask a developer, uh, you know, who's responsible for security uh, in your company? And they'll say, yeah, you know, we've got a security department, network security. You know, they do all the firewalls and stuff. They're responsible for the security of our applications. And that's absolutely not true. You've got a hole punched through the firewall, connecting straight through into your, into your application. The users are making requests straight into your application, and so your application is now part of your security perimeter. And so you need to make sure that your application is processing those requests correctly. I got a smiley face against that search engines being part of the problem, but in my opinion, it is to a certain extent part of the problem. And let me explain why. Quite often you'll go out there, I think many of you are self-taught, right? You haven't know, like been on formal courses on how to learn to develop web apps and that sort of thing. So you'll start off by, well, how do I create an HTML page? You know, Google and you'll find you know, W3C, HTML, and maybe some you know, how-to uh, guides. You think, well, okay, you know, here's my static page. It's all very nice. How do I add some functionality to it? So you'll go out and you'll Google. It's like, ooh, you know, pull some records from a database. And you'll come up with you know, 100 hits, and you'll take the first one, and you're saying, ooh, you know, that looks slightly complicated. You know, maybe there's an easier one. And eventually you'll find one that gives you a one-liner on how to do it, and there is not a single piece of information that you know, the word security is never mentioned anywhere. So you don't even realize that what you're doing is potentially opening up your applications to security problems. Um, so... They're not really part of the problem, but it's the whole uh, problem that people put out this information, all of the how to do things, without mentioning security as part of, the, part of the issue that you need to be aware of. So ultimately, lack of awareness of the problem, not knowing that security is an issue, is you know, a large part of the problem itself. So what can we do? Um, some of the things that the OS project is trying to do is uh, educating people, providing the documentation. Um, we also do a lot of training uh, through SANS, um, the SANS organization. We provide the web application training. Um, we provide tools where people can experiment uh, with the various vulnerabilities, for example, WebGoat. Um, get uh, people who know what they're doing to, to actually review your code for security vulnerabilities. And then, of course, you can try penetration testing at an application level, which is where WebScarab comes in. And that's ultimately why you guys are sitting here. So WebScarab is one of the flagship OWASP tools. Um, I've been working on it since 2003. It was actually my first Java program I've ever written. Um, and you'll see uh, the effects of that. Um, on the next slide. Um, some of the key features of WebScarab, it, basically it gives you the di direct access to the underlying HTTP protocol. One of the things I think that many people don't realize is that when you're programming to an API, that API is you know, shielding you a s to a certain extent from the underlying 
wire protocol, what's actually going across the, the wire. Um, so you, know, you call a J2EE API get cookie or get session, but you know, do you realize that it's actually setting a header which has set cookie equal you know, J session ID equal something like that being sent across the wire um, at a fundamental level? Um, so being able to see that and seeing that things like hidden fields are no different to a regular field when it's being sent across the uh, sent in a post request, um, I think highlights why you shouldn't be doing things with hidden fields. Um, so one of the key features is that it is an intercepting proxy. You can place it in between your browser and the server that you're uh, connecting to, and your browser will make the request to the proxy, i.e. Web Scarab. Web Scarab can then stop that request, present it in a, in a window, let you take a look at it, modify it, change it in any way you like, and then send that request off to the server. Um, intercept the response that comes back from the server. You can modify that if you like to change the behavior within your browser, and then um, just keep going. Uh, and it also supports SSL. So you see a lot of people, so, you, know, you click on the security button on their website, oh, we're using SSL and firewalls, and you know, they think that they've done a good job when it comes to security. The reality is SSL doesn't protect the site and it doesn't protect you against many attacks. All it does is stops people from eavesdropping on what's going on between you and the server, but it doesn't stop you from tampering with what's being sent to the server and it's not going to stop uh, an attacker either. It provides a session history, so you can actually see all of the requests that you've uh, sent, and it's got a bunch of um, various plugins. For example, a spider that will go out there and just download all the links that it can find, a fuzzer, which will try various inputs uh, sent up to the server um, to see what comes back. Uh, it's got some web services support. It's fairly rudimentary, but um, I'd be happy to take patches if anyone wants to uh, fix it up. And then it's got some scripting support using the Bean scripting framework. Okay, so this is the, the classic version of Web Scarab. Um, some of the problems, it's clunky as hell. <laughs> it's completely undiscoverable, unintuitive, etc. When I was writing it, I knew nothing about human interface guidelines. Um, and to be honest, I was really writing it for myself. I knew how to use it. You know, it didn't necessarily have to be easy for anybody else to figure it out. And stupid things like memory leaks and so on. So yeah, it's clanky. But the idea is, is pretty simple. Basically, um, this is the, the classic version, not the NG version. Uh, that I'm supposed to be talking about. Anyway, so in the summary panel shows you, you know, what's happened so far, and then there are a bunch of plugins across the top. You can see basically what Web Scarab thinks the, the site looks like, so the hierarchy of the sites that you're looking at, and then the history of all the conversations that you've looked at. And you can double click on them and it'll bring up the details of the request and the response that came through. Okay, so this is the NG version, next generation version of, uh, of Web Scarab. Um, as you can see, it looks a lot nicer. Um, and it's got a couple of neat features, such as the, um, the proxy toolbar, um, just along the top there, it's, um, starting where it says none and ending at the green box. Uh, that's actually a, f um, a stays on top window. So it's always there and always ready for you to be able to say, yes, intercept this next request or don't intercept. You know, previously, you'd have to switch back to Web Scarab, go to the proxy tab, turn it on, turn it off, and it's just a complete pain in the butt. So that sort of thing makes life a lot easier. Um, it's all dockable and draggable and uh, fancy like that. And the important thing is that um, it actually, uh, it's all integrated and makes sense in the way that the commands and the options and, and the forms, etc., work. So that's uh, a big improvement over the old version. So the improvements, the user, vis user visible ones are making use of the Spring Rich Client platform, which as I say is a, um, it's a platform for developing um, 
rich clients. Um, some of the problems in the old version, you, if you have multiple views on the same data and you modify it in one place, it doesn't necessarily always update correctly into other places where that data is being viewed. That's now all uh, kept consistent. New content type editors. Uh, WebScarab has got certain editors to allow you to view the content that is sent to the server and sent back from the server in various ways. Um, for example, if you're sending XML, it'll parse it out into, an X into a tree and you can modify it using a tree view. Uh, if you're sending JSON requests, it can actually also parse that out and make it easy for you to see what's being sent and modify those. Um, and so on. And then under the hood, the old version of WebScarab used to use a uh, just a whole series of flat files uh, in order to store the history that got uh, out of control very quickly. You make sort of two or three thousand requests and you've got uh, four to six thousand files sitting in a, di in a directory and that slows things down pretty dramatically. So all in all it's a, a pretty big improvement over the old version um, and so I'd like to show it to you. No, it's Java, so it's cross-platform. So no worries there. Oh. Okay, so there it is. Um, I'm going to bring up a browser as well. So this is um, basically showing you what WebGoat looks like. And basically WebGoat has got a whole bunch of exercises or lessons that you can go through in various categories. Um, and the idea is for you to explore and um, just to, to learn about what the various vulnerabilities are that... Um, that they're showing. For example, cross-site scripting, you know, how to perform a stored cross-site scripting attack. Let me just make it a bit bigger. Um, in this particular example, it's uh, uh, emulating a bulletin board or a message board system, but if you were to type in something like script Save that, whoops, hmm, okay, that shouldn't have happened. Ah. Okay, so I think most of you are probably aware of cross-site scripting, but the idea is just basically that um, WebGoat is, uh, is intended to allow you to explore a whole bunch of different uh, categories of vulnerability. Okay, um, so some examples. Uh, how to exploit a hidden field why you shouldn't use them. Let me just turn on my proxy control bar. And I'm going to intercept posts, which is, as you can see, you've got the option to intercept gets posts, uh, both of those, or all types, all methods. And so if I purchase my high def TV for $3,000, I get the opportunity to intercept it before it actually hits the server, and I can see that there is this hidden field which has a value of 299999. I am cheap, as you can see, and criminally inclined, and so I'm going to buy my high def TV for a dollar. Might seem ridiculous, but a lot of web stores around the 2001 2002 timeframe actually did this. 
they implemented their stores using this technique. Say again? Yeah. Okay, so um, that's a good intro to my next um, uh, example. Uh, in this case, we have some JavaScript client-side validation. We've got a variety of different rules that, um, th that need to be complied with. As you can see, if I change this in various ways, try and submit it, the validation fires and it won't let me carry on. Uh, let me just refresh that page. So if I want to submit, is this, if I want to submit uh, some data that doesn't match this client-side validation, I can actually just hit submit on some data that does match, that does pass validation, and then Oops. And send that off. And if the server is not re-performing that validation, then in many cases, I'm going to be able to cause that server to take action on data that it's not expecting. Um, in many cases, you can. Uh, for example, if you view the source of a page, you'll see there is a validate function which you can override in the, t in the, uh, you know, in the location bar up at the top. You know, JavaScript validate equals nothing. Um, in many cases, you can. In other cases, uh, what I'm doing is not considered cheating. The idea is that you need to understand the tools that are available to you in order to perform these kinds of um, attacks. Okay, so... Um, absolutely. Absolutely. There, there, I mean, there is nothing to say that an attacker is not going to use a Telnet client in order to submit a request to your, um, to your server. You know, HTTP is text-based. You know, I can use, qu quite often I'll make a request against a server using printf and netcat. <laughs> you know, shell printf get slash, etc. You know, slash r slash n, slash r slash n, pipe netcat, um, whatever, port 80, and, and it's done. Um, so absolutely, I don't, I don't believe that using a tool like WebScarab is cheating at all. Um, as somebody who is trying to defend you should be using all the tools at your disposal in order to do the best job you can. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, other examples for ex um, SQL injection into numeric and string fields. In this case, we have a simple drop down um, that allows us to check the, the weather at a particular location. Just cancel that. So, for example, Columbia Station 101 um, has a minimum of minus 10 and a maximum of 102. This is Fahrenheit. It's an American thing. Um, but if I intercept it, I can change this 101, which was in a drop-down, not modifiable inside your browser, change it to something like uh, 1 or 1 equals 1. If any of you know SQL, that's going to change it to an always true function. And we'll then return every single row in the table. So just really to show you that uh, an intercepting proxy is a very powerful tool for understanding the underlying request and data that is being sent to the server. Um, and to make you realize, or to encourage you to realize, that you need to be performing all kinds of, well, all of your validation on the server side, uh, and very carefully for various things. Um, the other part of this exercise is um, that it changes the request from constructing SQL statements using concatenation, which is really the core of the problem. You're mixing um, instructions, select star from table, with 
the data that those instructions are operating on. And so when, the, when you smash those two together, the underlying SQL parser has no way of knowing which is which. As far as it knows, it's just got a string of instructions to, uh, to work on. So in this case, um, the request has now been changed to use a pr uh, parameterized query, which is a safe um, form of, uh, of constructing SQL statements. Um, I can do the exact same attack, and you'll see that it's not possible anymore. Um, You'll see here the, we're now using the sort of question mark placeholder. We're compiling the statement in advance and then inserting the data into that uh, placeholder. Um, and so that generates a, um, an exception because our attack no longer parses as an integer, which is what is expected in this particular uh, placeholder. Okay. Another example, uh, command injection. Um, in this case, oh, sorry, no, this wasn't the one I wanted. I wanted. Mm, this is the one I wanted. Command injection is good enough. So in this case, again, we're going to intercept the request. It's passing this parameter to an underlying operating system shell to execute it. In this case, it's calling command.exe and the type command, which is pretty stupid. Normally, you're just going to read it from the, from the file system. But it illustrates the fact that many applications do call out to the operating system to access their functionality. So in this case, um, I'm going to close a quote, which was placed around this. I'm going to add an ampersand, which uh, also you can use to chain commands together, even on DOS. And something like... Um, So I'm chaining the extra echo on the end there because I know that I've got a trailing quote character that I've got to watch out for, otherwise it's going to cause me a syntax error. And so when I send that off, you can see my net stat and my quoted commands down at the bottom there. Um, ah. And then another example. These are all pretty much using the same functionality of Web Scarab, the intercept and modify. It's very powerful functionality. Um, but I'm going to show you something else um, after this. Again, modify the f um, act, change the uh, the file. In this case, I'm going to do a directory traversal attack. So I'm going to um, go up a couple of directories. And instead of getting the file in the local directory that I was supposed to get, all of a sudden I've downloaded the Tomcat users directory, uh, di uh, Tomcat users file with usernames and passwords and other fun information in it. So really just highlighting the importance of your data validation. Okay, so, so this is basically what you have in, um, in Web Scarab. You've got the requests which have been made or the history of, the, uh, of your conversations. Uh, you can filter those for various things. For example, if I only want to see the posts, um, it'll only show those. Or including everything else as well. And then as you select the conversation, you can see the details in uh, the, the windows down at the bottom there. So you've got the request on the left, 
parsed out in various ways, and then uh, the response over on the right-hand side. And the re you know, it's really um, designed to make it easy to understand what's going on, or if you like, you can see the complete raw data as it was sent on the wire. So now, if we decide, for example, that um, we want to, we've sent this request off, and we want to try and change something and send it again, we've got the manual request feature, which will copy the request over into this um, manual request view, and we can then modify it any way we like. Maybe we want to include something like change it to get the boot I and I off my root drive, a root directory, send that off, and if we scroll down, we should see they're the details of my boot.ini. So it doesn't always have to be done uh, using the browser. Sometimes it's just more convenient to replay a request or to modify it within Web Scarab and, uh, and to send that off. Uh, some of the things that's quite handy, um, it has a certain amount of built-in error reporting. As you type an invalid method, it'll tell you, you know, this is bogus, I don't know what to do with it. All I understand is trace, delete, options, post, head, get, and put. As you fix it up, it'll automatically um, take that error away and enable your fetch button, which was automatically disabled otherwise. So this is some examples of how Web Scarab ng is a big improvement over the old version. I think it's a lot more um, intuitive for, uh, for people to, to use. Um, the other uh, useful feature is a web services plugin. It's somewhat um, unreliable at the moment. It's a very new plugin which has just been added. Uh, the idea is basically it'll go and download the WSDL from uh, wherever um, wherever it is, parse it, and then construct the XML um, necessary to actually submit the request to the server, and you can put in whatever data you like and then uh, modify that. Um, yeah, that's actually, for some strange reason, it's just not working today. <laughs> I haven't figured out why. Yeah. No, no. Well, the idea, let me just, um, I'm going to, uh, crap. you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fire up the old version and show you what's supposed to happen. So as you can see in the old version, there's a lot more um, plugins than there are in, the, in NG. But if I just copy that URL over. Okay. That's interesting. No. No, no, it's still, it's just. I'm sorry? Ah, that explains it. Explains why I'm not getting anything. And it probably even work in the other one. Let's try that quickly. Uh. Bah. Yeah, the, the DOS is actually legitimate. That, that is allowed, but I don't think it should make any difference. But this should hopefully um, Okay, so there are four web service methods which are defined in this WSDL. If you choose, for example, get first name, um, it takes an integer parameter, 101, and if I execute that,
and you'll get the response, which shows that the first name of user number 101 is Joe. And it's kind of neat for uh, exploring the functionality of web services that are uh, available. Quite often what you'll find is sometimes there are methods that are exposed in the WSDL that just aren't expected to be there. Uh, tools like Access2 will just automatically introspect the classes that, uh, that are exported as a web service and expose all of their methods. Um, so if you don't realize that that's happening, quite often you're going to expose more things than you're, uh, than you're intending to. And yeah, that's pretty much what I had to, uh, to show you. If you guys have got any questions. Okay, so yeah, basically I was saying um, there's a lot of stuff that's not yet, um, not yet implemented. Things like the spider, um, the scripting, bean shell, um, bean scripting framework, et cetera, is not implemented. Um, there's some protocol support in the old web scarab that's not been implemented in the new web scarab. Uh, I don't support NTLM off in NG. Um, I support uh, SSL client certs and smart cards in uh, old version of web scarab, but not in the new version. Um, and then the shared cookie jar is just a mechanism for uh, tracking cookies between the proxy and uh, some of the various other plugins. So some future directions, some things I'd like to add. Um, an identity module, which automatically associates the identity of the user making the request. Um, so once you've logged in, you can associate your identity with that particular session identifier, uh, or it can be extracted automatically from the basic authentication credentials, perhaps, from the client-side SSL cert. Um, all that sort of information can provide an identity, and it's useful to be able to track uh, the identity across a whole sequence of requests. Um, and that will uh, support things like reverse engineering and access control matrix in your application. So if you log on as one user, see which things you can access, fire, uh, fire up the spider and track down all the links that that person can see. Do the same thing for a different user, maybe an administrative user, and then see if your unprivileged user can still access those links that the, um, the administrator can do. Then it'll show you that you're doing things like presentation layer access control, where you say, well, I'm not going to show you the link if you're not allowed to access it, but if you know what that link is, I'll still allow you to execute the function. I think you can see that that's a bad idea. So that sort of uh, functionality in Web Scarab would help to expose that uh, flawed logic. Um, the classic version of Web Scarab has a random um, session, a uh, random generator quality assessment tool, uh, checks the takes a sampling of uh, session identifiers and checks to see uh, how random they are. The old version is pretty, it looks cool, but it's pretty badly flawed. Um, new version will perform um, proper random analysis, uh, kind of like Michelle Zalewski's Stompy tool, which is a very cool tool. Um, and then things like re-implementing re the HTTP client, um, for a tool like Web Scarab, you really want to have complete control over the HTTP protocol so that any, th any conclusions that you come to with regards to how the client behaves when it receives something from the server or how the server behaves when it receives something from the client is not unduly influenced by the tool that you've placed in between them. Because in many situations, if you want to extrapolate this to the broader internet, they're not going to have the tool in between. So you want to make sure that your conclusions are valid um, without the tool. And in some cases, apparently things as simple as the number of, of spaces between the colon in the header and the value can actually make a difference. I haven't encountered those myself, but uh, one of my users has uh, complained. And so if you want to try it out, you can run Web Scarab. It's available using Web Start. There's the URL. Um, join the list, uh, hosted at OWASP.org. You can access the source in a, in a Git repository on my server, and then clone the repo, um, build it using Maven 2, and um, let me know how you're doing. And now, if you have any questions, I'm all yours. Sure. The 
there was an attempt to um, to build in some automation functionality into Web Scarab NG as part of the uh, recent spring of code. Uh, the person who was tr trying to implement that never actually got anywhere. Um, it really depends what you mean by automating the tests, though. Okay. Um, right. The it, at the moment, no. Short answer, no. Um, it's something that I'd like to add because I think it would be valuable. Um, if you have any ideas as to how it should be presented, now how would you like this to work? Please let me know, and if I can get my head around it, I'll build it. Anyone else? SP Nego with, Ker with Kerberos? No, I don't. Um, that is pretty, pretty tricky to get right. Um, the funny thing is, uh, it will actually work um, using IE because you can proxy SP Nego. Um, so you'll see a 401 come back. The, the first time you make the request, you'll get a 401 unauthorized with the handshake details. Your browser will then perform the necessary handshake. So every you know, second or third, or so I say two out of every three conversations will be negotiation. But you will actually be able to see and intercept the, uh, the requests. Uh, it'll be tedious, <laughs> but uh, you will actually be able to do it. You just won't be able to do things like the uh, manual request replaying um, because Web Scarab itself doesn't support it, but it will allow it to be passed through. Yeah, you'll see the token going backwards and forwards, but um, yeah, there's, there's no insight into the content of the token. There are some SP Nego uh, Java libraries. Um, not freely available, though, as far as I recall. Uh, the JSIFS project was working on implementing SP Nego. I don't know how far they've got. Last time I looked at it was a couple of years ago. I've actually never, ever had to uh, test against an SP Nego uh, server. Anyone else? Um, what's going on in the local AS countries? Um, a lot of them are very active. Um, the New York chapter in particular is, our, I think it's our largest uh, chapter, I think being in the financial district and, and so on. They got something like 250 active members. I mean, that's incredible. Our OWASP conference that we had in San Jose last year had around 250 people. <laughs> and they get that on a monthly basis. That's, it's very, very impressive. There is a local um, OWASP chapter. The chapter lead is a guy named Sebastian de Leerschneider. Um, and they're pretty active here as well in, uh, in Brussels. Yeah, the details are all available up on the, uh, the OWASP site. Um, and you can uh, get in contact with Sebastian and whoever else is uh, busy in the local chapter. Um, yeah, the, the local chapters, um, I, didn't, I don't think I gave you a chance to look at this. But that's basically flags where there are local chapters around the world. So um, it's pretty extensive. I think there's quite a lot here in Europe. Um, and uh, Asia and America as well. We don't have training as such. Um, one of the things that we've tried to avoid is getting into the, the training, um, uh, the certification kind of things. We've provided a whole bunch of material. Um, the SANS organization does perform um, web AppSec training, and my company performs web AppSec training, so maybe there's a bit of a conflict of interest in that sort of thing. But um, there is some discussion on the OWASP leaders mailing list at the moment about certification, and I think so far the consensus is that it's something we don't really want to, to get into. Anyone else? Great, thank you very much.